Hello everyone. Thank you so much for deciding to join us on a beautiful uh, Friday afternoon. I think we have to uh, thank climate change for the beautiful weather. Um, <laughs> no, seriously, I appreciate it. I think that this is, uh, and thanks so much to Ron and Abigail for putting this together. Um, I think that this is a really um, timely and well curated discussion. For those of you who have been following the conversation, I think you're going to be pleased with um, I like a couple things that I have to share with you guys, but also some of the questions that I hope you engage as the yeah, was, uh, was mentioning. How many of you guys are familiar with the New York City Environmental Justice Alliance? Oh well, well and there's a lot of grad students, so. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but for those of you who aren't, the New York City Environmental Justice Alliance is a nonprofit, uh, citywide, and membership-based organization that works uh, in the, with communities, uh, grassroots organizations in low-income communities of color and their struggle for environmental justice. Today I'm going to share with you guys a little bit of uh, the work that we've been doing uh, regarding uh, climate change, community resiliency, climate change adaptation, um, etc. Uh, I'm going to start a little bit with um, some recent research that we are, have been using in different campaigns to try to understand where are the vulnerable communities in New York City. And then touch a little bit on the Pack the People's Climate March, uh, not in and of itself, but in terms of what that allowed, a campaign called New York Renews and Nija's Climate Justice Agenda. This map shows the location of the Nija member organizations, and the red outlines are the six uh, city significant maritime and industrial areas. These are industrial waterfront communities that are heavily vulnerable to climate change impacts but are also the historic, the places where the historic environmental justice communities have been located. So on one end, you have um, heavy industrial and manufacturing uses that are located in these areas, uh, literally across the street from various types of residential uses, uh, but particularly um, the most vulnerable uh, communities based on socioeconomic, demographic, uh, public health, and other types of indicators denoting uh, how really vulnerable these groups are. This is a map that overlays the location of the significant maritime and industrial areas to the uh, storm surge projections created by the uh, state uh, agency, the New York State Office of Emergency Management. And as you can see, all of those significant maritime and industrial areas are vulnerable even to the lowest um, or the less, the less strong uh, purity category. So this is a map that then overlays the significant maritime industrial areas to the location of the population of color. And if you focus, for example, in the South Bronx or North Brooklyn, you can see how the majority of the census tracts in those areas have over 60% of their population, the population of color, uh, kind of like illustrating a little bit the type of vulnerability that I was describing. Something very similar happens when you look at the median household income in New York City. Uh, where, again, these areas concentrate the lowest median household incomes. But also, these are areas where, after Sandy, 64% of renters and 30% of owners that were impacted by Sandy uh, report incomes below $30,000 per year. Now, we've been talking a little bit about the type of, of how environmental justice and coastal uh, flooding or storm surge uh, begin to sort of like overlap. This is a slightly different map, and I don't know if Chloe, Chloe's here, so um, um, I just want to highlight this. She hasn't seen this map, but she's been, we've been comparing notes on the subject. So this is a map that overlays research from the public health team in the New York City Panel on Climate Change uh, that have, has been looking at the vulnerability of, uh, at, has been documenting community vulnerability to um, the urban heat island effect where the red, orange, and red colors denote highest vulnerability based on population characteristics, but also infrastructure uh, status. And as you can see, from like central Brooklyn, the South Bronx begin to really pop up. Now, on the other hand, the, red, the, the black boundary that you see there is the boundary of the Brooklyn-affected or Brooklyn-targeted neighborhoods by Con Edison's Brooklyn Queens Demand Management Pool. So let me stop there for a second. So Ilya mentioned REV. How many of you guys are not familiar with REV? 
Okay, cool. So Rev, as Lilia mentioned, is really transforming the way in which New York State, New York State is talking about energy. One of the opportunities about Rev is that it has begun, begun to mandate that utilities take a more progressive approach towards thinking about energy infrastructure by really encouraging the creation of uh, renewable energy, um, but also engaging customers in participating in, in, in the energy market. While the PSC, the New York State Public Service Commission, which is a regulator you know, that, that in this case controls uh, the provision of energy, the utility for our region, Con Edison, has begun crafting a demonstration project. So while the rules of the game are still in flux, Con Edison has already hit the ground in central Brooklyn with the Brooklyn Queens Demand Management Program, which is basically a series of different interventions to essentially address a 40 plus megawatt gap in the amount of energy that is going to be required in those neighborhoods within the boundary and what the infrastructure of the local substation is able to provide. So the reason why I wanted to show this map is because not only the New York, the New York City Panel on Climate Change and specifically the public health team there is telling us where are the communities that are most vulnerable to heat but the utilities are telling us that those same neighborhoods are experiencing the largest challenges in keeping energy, electricity going. So the places where people, and by the way, heat kills much more people than coastal flooding or storm surge. The same neighborhoods where people are most vulnerable to heat are the same neighborhoods where the city is already reporting challenges in keeping those ACs running. So the challenges and the overlap between environmental justice, climate justice, um, and climate change impacts is 100%. So I'm not going to ask how many of you guys went there. I'm assuming that all of you were there are in the future. <laughs> so for you. The importance of the People's Climate March, like it's like being sort of like this massive manifestation that had you know lots of um, uh, participants, but also lots of um, events across the globe. Uh, in support for it, was that it really sort of sent a very clear message to um, dignitaries, governments, that people cared, that people were, that the discussion was not technical anymore, that, that this was not political, that it was time to take action, right? Now climate change is not, not, not a question anymore, uh, it's really being experienced in many places for real, and people need and require action. In addition to that, it brought together environmental groups, environmental justice groups, uh, and labor to really work together. And they created, in fact, the New York, New Jersey uh, Host Committee, which really was the entity that organized the march. And that has carried on. One thing that I want to say before I turn, I turn to kind of like the two campaigns that I want to talk about is that after the People's Climate March, there was a lot of excitement. Not for nothing, it was right after the People's Climate March that President Obama signed the bilateral agreement with China to begin reducing emissions, carbon emissions, uh, for the first time, really, as, as kind of like a mutual agreement. It was also followed, as, as, as Ilya referenced, by Mayor de Blasio's announcement of the 80 by 50 you know, commitment, right? Reducing 80% of emissions in New York by, by 2050. The problem is, that when the COP21 ended, a lot of the promises or the expectations were really not met. This is, this is kind of like, um, I've, I've presented with Lillian in the past, and I think that I'm always a little more pessimistic on some of the issues. But, um, but I, I want to share with you kind of like the, 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 the standing point where the two campaigns that I want to talk about um, are kind of like really built upon. Number one, if you look at what happened in Paris, you will see that a lot of the agreements, the emission costs that resulted out of that were really voluntary, are really voluntary pledges that were, that were um, basically drawn upon by the individual governments and were written down before the negotiations. So there's nothing really requiring them to take action. A lot of it is voluntary. On the other hand, Oh, and by the way, if, if, when, if you look at the agreement, and I encourage you guys to see the agreement, the words fossil fuel, oil, or coal are not in the agreement. So I don't know how can we talk about climate change without those words. Second, 
it's now sort of like the, the studies basically, the science basically says that in order to transition to a fossil free world, more or less, we're going to need a thousand billion dollars per year. Now, the commitments from the different governments have only been at a hundred billion dollars per year. So there's a really big gap in terms of the resources that have been committed to make this happen. Money aside, there is a, a real, there was a, a real sort of like missed opportunity here, which was to connect climate change with justice, environmental and climate justice. For example, the agreement itself, and I'm quoting this, says there is no basis for any liability or compensation for countries already suffering climate change impacts. So there is no, under, under kind of like a basis of human rights, there is nothing really tangible that you can connect, that you can say or quote, connecting climate change to any sort of like a meaningful concept of justice. And that includes, of course, um, indigenous rights, which are like part of, along with environmental justice communities, at the front line of the places where, or the communities that are really been really impacted by climate change. Not now, not yesterday, but decades ago. And then finally, kind of like going back to, to a point that Ilya was making, I also wanted to highlight how the agreement, I mean, it's a political agreement in nature, but it really doesn't go into any detail in terms of the technologies. And, and, and the, 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 kind of like the, 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 the point here, commending the, the, the efforts that AIA is doing, but also what the city of New York is doing, is that this is a technical conversation. And, and in order to get there, we really need the research and really need to be specific about how is it that we should get there and what are the technologies that we shouldn't use because they exacerbate and, and, and increase the disproportionate burden on the neighborhoods that we have been uh, experiencing the, the, the impacts the most. I'm going to go back here for a second and talk a little bit about what that means in terms of energy. So those neighborhoods that I was pointing out are within the black boundary, right? The places that are most vulnerable to heat, but also where Con Edison is experiencing those challenges, are also, are also communities that have historically been impacted by the polluting infrastructure, right? Required to generate that energy. And REV is just scratching the surface at requiring that there are environmental justice controls and clean energy resources funded in the places that need it the most. In this case, neighborhoods that historically, you know, have been uh, affected by public health implications related with asthma, etc. And uh, you know, Colvin is here, and he, he can definitely share much more about the work that they're doing in that area. In fact, Colvin is part of uh, the Brooklyn Alliance for Sustainable Energy, which is a coalition that that Nija helped uh, co uh, convene, where we've been working on BQDM um, head to head. So let's talk about the campaign. So the first one is called. NY Renews. So building on the People's Climate March, uh, New York, New Jersey Committee. There's now a uh, coalition, a statewide coalition of grassroots organizations from environmental, environmental justice, and labor to really um, work around a couple, a series of very concrete goals. Perhaps one of the most important ones is the, the, the requirement to really uh, achieve um, or uh, uh, an 80% reduction in emissions by 2050 and ensure that there is um, a clean transition to a fossil free world. In this case, in the state of New York. The second one is requiring that state agencies not only are mandated with you know, responding to um, uh, all the different uh, uh, opportunities to post for, for them to uh, contribute to the reduction of the carbon emissions, but also to make sure that there is coordination within the, the different agencies so that those regulations you know, are really well, well, well coordinated and that there is accountability in terms of how much we need to, to, to achieve uh, with uh, four-year reports uh, that, that are being proposed. But in, in order to get there, we need to make sure that the um, potential regressive impacts that these policies can have, right? If we begin closing down uh, a power plants, as Cecilia was, was calling, which I wholeheartedly support, uh, we need to make sure that the workers and the families that depend on those plants 
um, are provided with the right technical and financial resources for them to transition um, uh, to, to a fossil free um, economy. In addition to that, environmental justice goals here are critical because all of the efforts that, you, that I've referred today are focused on greenhouse gases. Greenhouse gases are not the gases that are creating the public health impacts that I was referring to a couple slides ago. In fact, when you, if you only focus on carbon, yes, you are mitigating climate change impacts, but you're not addressing the particulate matter, the NOx, the SOx, the ozone levels that are creating the respiratory issues in the environmental justice communities. So as part of the legislation that I'm going to be talking about in a second, we're making sure that there's a commitment to reduce both. And then just finally, as I mentioned before, there's, there's a really uh, dual commitment to make sure that while we advance the environmental justice agenda, we're really protecting the jobs, in, encouraging the, 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 the clean economy jobs, and making sure that, that transition is a just transition. So this is, a, this is um, uh, a campaign that is composed of a couple different factors or, or, or elements. On one end, we will be introducing legislation very soon, statewide legislation, uh, and there's also a series of mobilization um, activities uh, that, that, are, that, are, that will follow. In terms of legislation, there's many things to talk about. I'm gonna focus on four quick things. One is that for the first time, we are really trying to, to create a definition of disadvantaged communities that, that, that encompasses, that is comprehensive and meaningful to encompass the relationship that I was describing a minute ago. On one end, to make sure that we are really targeting and identifying the communities that are most vulnerable to climate change, either because of the, their direct impact or because of the existing levels of vulnerability that build on sort of the legacy of um, both uh, concentration of vulnerable neighborhoods demographically, socioeconomically, but also where there have been legacies of racial um, and ethnic discrimination. At the same time, as I was mentioning a minute ago, we want to make sure that we can focus on providing the resources to disadvantaged communities that will be affected by the closing of power plants, etc. And then finally, we want to make sure that any revenues that derive from these regulations can be redistributed to the communities that need it the most. So how do we do that? We are going to be proposing the creation of an environmental justice working group that is going to be basically going to be overseeing that that objective is met. And, and essentially making, creating kind of like the a EJ screen tool that will allow to scientifically identify where these communities are and be able to, and, and, and be actually composed, so the working group will actually be composed by members of the community, not only from New York City, but from upstate, rural, and urban uh, communities, to make sure that the EJ screen tool can be adjusted and modified to re respond to the differences of how these uh, different communities look like and the challenges that they're experiencing, and be able to modify it and change it as those needs and priorities evolve. And then, um, as, I, as I mentioned earlier, the, the, the perhaps most important aspect of, of kind of like the regulations themselves is that, and this is different from other states, really I think that New York State would be sort of pioneering in, in, in regulating a mechanism to really discuss co-pollutants, which are kind of like these other gases beyond um, carbon that are really having the public health impacts as part of the commitment to achieve uh, climate change mitigation, so that environmental justice and climate justice are really part of the framework. So let me just transition to, to, to the last part of the, of the presentation where I wanna literally just kinda like um, share with you guys the framework of an effort where the New York City Environmental Justice Alliance has been you know, investing a, a lot of uh, resources over the last year, and where we're hoping to release a report on money. So please, you know, indulge me when, when I sort of uh, not share too much detail. Because what I really want to do is, is sort of like create the seed for you guys to read the report on Monday. <laughs> so so well Mayor de Blasio, uh, Kelly Carey, who at the point was um, executive director at the point, um, a, uh, an alumni and, and, and a, a former panelist in this event, 
Um, and a lot of the NIJA member organizations, and by the way, I'm already the one there in the corner. I have to point that out. Many people don't see it. I know it's hard to see it, but I'm there. Um, and uh, so, but this is really important, right? One NYC, all of a sudden, for the first time, although environmental justice and other advocates have been requesting this for decades, for the first time, begins to connect sustainability, but also resiliency uh, with equity, right? So this is sort of like a really important kind of like step forward. Announces a series of very ambitious goals, but very little in terms of how to get there. So what the New York City Environmental Justice and its members have been working on is a, a, a serious and very detailed assessment of how do the different proposals respond to climate justice in New York City and how much progress have we done in that regard. And in addition to reviewing the document, we've been interviewing many different city agencies as well as consulting with the media member organizations and some of our allies in terms of what are they doing. Because when you look at this, a lot of the most innovative work is really taking place at the grassroots level and from the bottom up. So as you will see on Monday, the report focuses on, on five different um, sort of um, areas of, of research, uh, climate adaptation and mitigation really, equity and infrastructure, public health, community preparedness and community-based planning as sort of the five pillars that we uh, focus on to create our recommendations. And based on, and, and because based on the analysis, and the inventory really of community-based uh, initiatives at the end of the day, the idea is to be able to put forth uh, a platform that can help uh, uh, 